Don't tap podcast. Don't tap podcast. Follow me on Twitter. Hey, I'm UFC President Dana White, and you're in the ring with Callum McGregor. Okay, Don't Tap Podcast, we are back. Um, technically a week off for a lot of people because the, the UFC was out. Uh, PFL was in, though. Um, and, man, did we take an ass kicking on the podcast last week. Um, to make it, you know, to, no excuses, to make it really simple and plain. Um, just got too cute with spots. I, I should have maybe just parlayed spots where I thought there were specific people that were going to win no matter what. I was trying to go for props. Decisions happened over finishes. And that was the downfall of the picks. Um, Impaka Sangane comes through, no KO hit, and that was at the bottom of the list. I was okay if that one didn't hit, but his money line hits. But everything else just blew up in a dumpster fire. But I think you you maybe uh, did well. How did you do on uh, the card? Uh, last week in America, we call uh, Thanksgiving week Feast Week, uh, where it's like a simulation of like March Madness. So uh, – my focus has been in uh, the college basketball streets and uh, took a nice little pass off the PFL. I'm glad I did because everything I would have bet would have lost. So uh, I'm, the only one that probably would have won was the Jesus Pineda spot. I like Severia in the Impa I fight. Um, Derek Brunson line kind of came crashing down. But uh, it was a good week to pass. Enjoy with your family. Uh, get away from the MMA game because uh, – you gotta kind of got to get used to uh, capping the other sports because we're coming to a conclusion of a uh, nice little MMA year with only a couple more events left in the calendar year. Yes, sir. And uh, I mean, th- one of the spots that we looked at was uh, Derek Brunson, and man, I-, I faded him, you know. And I, I, he came in whether you want to call it juicy or not, or whatever the hell you want to call it, road work. You can call it whatever the fuck you want to call it. Uh, he impressed me, um, even though, you know, sort of the near the end. I mean, he, he sort of weathered the storm at points. You could tell he was sort of holding on at the end, but he, he wins. Um, Aspen Ladd, probably the biggest Im- impressive scenario. I know that she sort of took a little bit of a beating, but she didn't give up. Mentally, she looked tough in that fight, which was one thing you always look for from her. Um, so those those are the the wins you have to see in some. Like, I, I wasn't backing Aspen Ladd. I was um, obviously on the other side of it, but... Anyways, yeah, so there was a, a couple spots where I should have maybe put a hammer on and, and a couple spots where we should have just backed the fuck up. But let's the whole at- merger in itself is kind of was kind of throwing me off the PFL event. I feel like they're uh, looking on to bigger and better things, and that wasn't this season's finals. The most interesting fights weren't even part of the tournament. I mean, they're all showcase bouts. The one spot I just think I should have found spots um... – was even just the money line I should have hammered even harder was in Bukazangana. I just, I felt so strong about that play. Um, and even though it was like minus 160 when I first, you know, we, we first touched it, it went up to about what, what, minus 190 or whatever. But I mean, still, I just felt so strong about that spot. Um, and like a late, late finish decision might have been the other way to look at it as well, too. But anyway, uh, we move forward into the UFC card and uh, very interesting changes to the card. Um, obviously, Dan Hooker is out and Jalen Turner is in. That should be an interesting one. Um, I imagine we will talk about that at some point tonight, but I'm going to let you take a uh, a hit at your, you know, take your first spot as you're taking a hit of your, your what is that, your vape or your, <laughs> what, what, what was that, some chronic? We got, um, we got, we got both. We got both on deck. Yeah, you like gotcha. the nicotine, you like the marijuana. We got it all. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so take it away with your first spot. Um, I had accidentally put out, started to put my plays together two weeks ago, not realizing there was a gap in the, in the schedule. I just kept going and going, and then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm jumping ahead here. Um, so I've been sitting with these spots for a couple of weeks now. Um, I'm interested to see what you're looking at. I know a lot of people are looking at uh, some specific spots, but what's, what's your first take? First spot that I'm looking at here is Sean Brady versus Kevin Gaslam. I'm liking overs here. Uh, I'm seeing the over one and a half on bet online at minus 215 and fight to start round three. Um, hasn't came out yet on FanDuel, but I would imagine we get that close to even odds. Feels like the market's kind of underestimating the durability of Sean Brady coming off that KOTK loss 
in his last matchup versus below Muhammad. Brady's 8-0 in his career when fights have gone to the judges' scorecards. And in this particular matchup, I don't see him getting submitted. The only way I would see him losing would be a fluke knockout by Kevin Gaslam. But he doesn't really propose the same power as he once had early on in his career. When you look into Kevin Gaslam's record, seven out of his last eight fights in general have gone to the judges' scorecards. His last loss inside a distance was versus Jack Hermanson in 2018 via heel hook, which is a very random type of submission or outcome that usually doesn't happen too much. And then in 2017 versus Wyman, he got an arm triangle choke uh, where he got choked out. So um, I think this fight is going to hit the judges' scorecards with Sean Brady getting his hand raised. I knew we were going to be on the opposite side of this one, and it makes me smile. Uh, what a way to start this off. So I was looking at Kevin Gaston already at plus 100 a week ago. Um, then it went up to plus 120. Now it's sitting about plus 115. And I just think this is actually where I missed a spot on Brunson, where it's the idea of uh, a vet with levels. And, and, and I get that Brady's a little bit more than he's not a debutante. Brady is a legit real deal dude. Um, he just sort of got caught. It is what it is. And I'm not going to sort of devalue him based on that scenario. It just doesn't make any sense. But I just think stylistically that Gaslam's going to be able to, to play enough defense in the grappling, enough defense in the wrestling, because um, he does have solid wrestling. He doesn't typically use it because he's been sort of stuck in these stand-up battles with some of the top of the division, right? Um, the thing that I find interesting in this fight is he's dropping down to 170. And obviously, if we see a dumpster fire of a, a weight cut um, and a weight miss or something that's really bad, sell, sell, sell. We're getting off the, ga the Gaslam train. But for me, him wanting to cut down to 170 is very interesting. It seems well, like the last time serious. he cut down to 170, he got that eye injury. Yeah, no, I know. I know there was the eye injury and the speculation of whatever else, just some some muckiness. But um, but if you look at him, man, like he's lost to Whitaker, Cannoneer. I mean, the Hermanson one's the one that I think that sort of sticks out to me that that is the big issue. Darren Till on the feet is the one that where I really had an issue where he should have shown his wrestling more and got Darren Till to the mat and really just smashed him. And he, he's sort of been OK with standing on the feet. With some guys right but standing on the feet with adesanya standing on the feet with till um whitaker even um whitaker tricky as fuck these are all some of the highest level guys around and now we're dropping down to sean brady and i still think that brady could be one of the top five at some point because he does have that level of jujitsu mixed in with you see the progression in the striking as well too um but i just think that this isn't a, a spot where we have plus money on a, a vet and we don't take it um, I just think that Gaslam's going to be able to keep it on the feet, land um, bigger moments. Um, I'm interested to see how he's going to look at 170. Obviously, if it looks like a dumpster fire of a cut, um, it's a sell. But if it looks good, I mean, I'm, I'm almost even going to double down on it then. Um, so for me, I just give me Kevin Gaslam with these and keep it on the feet. I think it is going to be potentially a decision, but I think it's going to be grappling versus moments on the feet. And I'll take the moments on the feet. Um, but I'm glad that we're on either side of this. It's a, a good welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah, as, like I, I, once said. I, I, I would say, though, uh, back to the theory of the start of this conversation, I think the overs in this fight are the way to go. I think fight starts around three over one and a half minus 215. That's partly piece. I see some uh, time coming off the clock. Uh, maybe Gaslam defends some of the early takedowns and the going, and maybe this fight stalls out on the feet throughout the first round. And then the second round, we'll start seeing some grappling stages, probably Sean Brady taking Kevin Gaslam down, Kevin Gaslam getting back up, and then Sean Brady kind of pushing him up against the fence. And then that really falls into the factor of uh, are we judging this by control time or are we judging this by damage? If you're judging this by damage, then uh, the value would probably be on the dog here. But if we're judging this just basically off of control time, I think Sean Brady he has the ability to get the control time and enough damage to get his hand raised. I mean, dudes, the, for him to lose a decision here would be pretty shocking. I mean, he's 8-0 in his career when fights have been the judges' scorecards. It's a pretty strong record. Uh, granted, not maybe the level of competition Kevin Gaslam has been fighting, but um, I think that just shows towards his durability, his cardio, and his fight IQ. Uh, kind of somewhat of an undervalued spot from all the Philly boys. We've seen Andre Petrowski take a loss uh, of recent. We've seen Pat Sabatini take a loss of recent. Um, so Sean Brady's kind of the last one left around. I mean, we even saw uh, Jeremiah Wells take a loss as a huge uh, live favorite. He was like minus 1,000 then lost. So uh, I feel like uh, it, the bookies are kind of somewhat undervalued, Sean Brady here. But 
Uh, instead of finding out if there's value on either side, I think I'm just going to roll with the time props here. Um, I see some time getting extended on this clock, but what's your first play of the card? And I don't mind that as far as, you know, both of us going back and forth on it. If you look at the sort of like um, with what we both talked about and how, how the play comes out, Gaslam, although he's the dog and he's sort of everybody's expecting this to go under at some point. I don't see it either. I think it's going to stretch out as well, too. I think that Brady's um, sort of win condition, he's going to have to really the first round. I don't care what his control time is, if he's just even weighing down on Gaslam, trying to gas him out. Then start to work, and even if he's on on the on the ground for most of the fight, he's gonna have to attack submissions, you know, score points that way, and make them like some dangerous chokes, you know. And even if he knows he might not fully get them, he's gonna have to score points that way, and not just try to strike. If he does, Gaslam might get back to his feet. Um, so just a little bit of mixing, a little bit of the striking, but then attack some subs too, use them as value. Um, if he doesn't do that and just tries to accrue uh, control time, it's gonna be an issue. But if he does do that, then it will actually lean to the over. So um, not a bad play, not a, a bad way to look at it. Um, I do like that play. I'm going to still go with Gashlam as uh, one of my, my top plays of the week, though. I like him at uh, plus 115. I just think on the feet, he's going to be able to, to land more, and he's going to be enough, scrambly enough on the ground to not make it uh, much of an issue. So, But I do uh, I like the back and forth. So I will uh, let you bring in your next spot because you, you sort of drew out my spot. So we'll come in with another one from you. Yeah, this one is a uh, one that – you know, you got to stick around for the Instagram to see how official, official this one's going to become. But the more and more I'm looking into the spot, Chakar Close versus Joe Selecki here. I'm kind of liking the prospect here, Joe Selecki here on the money line at slight dog odds. Um, I feel like this is one of the spots where, as a better, you're kind of reaching, calling somebody, saying that they're going to turn down in form here. I mean, because it's your Jakar Close has won five out of his last six matchups, but I think he could be trending down in form coming off ACL injury at the age of 35 uh, versus a unproven prospect, we'll say, about Joe Selecki. But he'll be getting a step up in competition. But Jakar Close, granted, uh, don't let the you name decisions fool you. He always fights f fights closer than intended odds, being taken down in every one of his fights, which sets up for a huge problem here versus Joe Selecki. When he takes fights to the ground, he ain't looking for no control time. He's looking to finish fights and go for submissions, and I think he'll be rewarded for that. And um, I kind of like Joe Selecki here at this low price tag. It could be a levels fight where the veteran proves that um, he is deserving of those top 15 opponents that we thought that your car close is going to get. But um, I kind of like Joe Selecki here in this fight. And you uh, pull out a spot that I was actually going to be asking you about because I couldn't find the line on it um, was the spread play on that. I don't think there's any spread play out yet. Um, so when you come back, just if you can see, oh, you're right there. Um, is, if there's a spread play um, on that one, because I was looking at that too, man. I was trying to see, like, if this goes to decision, does Drakkar keep it on the feet a lot? But, man, so like he's a backpack. He gets control time, and he does actually land a little bit of strikes on the ground enough, but then he also attacks submissions. Um, no spread we were play just, on this. Literally just talking about. Um, so you may be talking me into adding him to the mix as a dog he's one of those spots that was like on my card that i'm because i guess a lot of people are looking at selecki as potentially the dog value spot there's a couple couple of those on the, on the card right um so i definitely see where he could definitely accrue control time on the back and be aggressive he is pretty aggressive he is very high level jujitsu man joe selecki's no joke no slouch um so i definitely see value in that one but i was even looking at this i was like wondering if I know Jakar Close, I don't think he's been submitted in the UFC, but I, I just was even looking at the, the Selecki submission. I think it was around plus 320, but I mean that might be a stretch yeah. now. Yeah. But even even at money line, man, to win a decision, it's I don't I don't mind it at all. So it feels like a spot where if Joe Selecki was like a big favorite or something like two to one minus two hundred, we would be betting the submission or decision line but it's like we don't really need to bet the submission or decision line we're getting minus 105 so it's up to us to do our due diligence to make sure is it all go i think there's even like, a couple books sorry to interrupt i think there's even a couple books that have plus money on it because it's like let me double check here i know it was at least yesterday because it's sort of a one of those ones where it's sort of torn the reason why i have the circle to spot regardless where this line goes i think joe selecki's the spot it's just the little things that you have to really do the due diligence on the weigh-ins, the interviews and stuff like that. And looking at the interview for Jakar Close, 
coming off an ACL injury, kid in February, age of 35. Like, you know, you're maybe you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, you're talking <laughs> me into it. You're talking me onto the spot. This is obviously going to be the audio we're going to use um, for the clip because uh, I think Selecki might end up being a, a podcast play. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of those things definitely scream a Selecki side. You can even get at uh, Unibet plus 107 right now, plus 105 at Pinnacle. Um, so some decent spots out there for Joe Selecki, even just hitting at money line. It might be one of the money line plays of the week. So it will shuffle up the the card from what I was initially looking at. So thank you. We, we, we're on the other side of one, and then you talk me into one. So that works too. Okay. Um, next spot that I was going to look at, I actually put together um, – just a little prop play, and I think you might be on the same side with me on this one. Um, I also will probably look at any kind of time prop if I can see it, but I think it's going to be juiced no matter what we look at. The under one and a half is juiced right now. Um, fight doesn't start round two might be, interest me, but you think I think you know where I'm going with this one. We're going to go with Bellotto and, and Ihor Pretoria. I'm going to go Bellotto KO plus 150. Let's just keep it nice and simple. Um, you know, so, something like a unit on that sounds good to me, or if, you know, like, yeah, straight up. I just think he's going to finish it inside the distance. Um, I don't see a uh, submission out of this one. I think Ihor, although he can finish the fight too, and you may want to take an under prop somewhere on some kind of parlay or whatever the hell you want to do to um, hedge it a little bit for yourself. But the reality of the fact is, is I just think that Ihor is going to be reckless. And that's what he does. He's going to leave himself exposed and Blotto is just going to land. This is not Petrino who's going to take him down a bunch um, and just beat up his soul. It, it's it's Ihor Pretoria who, who beat up you know, uh, retiring Shogun Hua and then celebrated afterwards like a fucking douchebag. So um, it's one time I can sort of be a little bit, you know, aggressive towards a, a fighter, even though he would take my soul if, if I even looked at him. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go with Bellotto, uh KO plus 150. I like it. And if you want to even be safe with it, do like Bellotto round one and two. You know, if you like, there is ways to attack this um, with, with sort of a time situation or, or prop it up. But I mean, if you want to be safe, try to find just the time prop. But I, I think Bellotto's aside in this one. I just a little bit of a step ahead, but more well-rounded martial artist. Um, and I think Ihor has not. Ihor is very, you know, he does get on your hips sometimes, but he wants to throw punches and leave his chin in the air. Um, and he, that doesn't really change. That's something that's hard. That's hard to train out of somebody. So, um, yeah, I think uh, that will be a spot that uh, I think both both. I think a lot of people are going to be on that one, to be honest. Um, Seems like you bring another spot to the table. Uh, man, do I hate women's MMA these last couple of weeks, but I think there's a little bit of value on this line, even though it's gone out one way. But I think the one way direction of the market is telling you that the one direction is the side to go here. And this Jamie Lynn Horth versus Veronica Hardy here, I like Jamie Lynn Horth here on the money line. Uh, it's bad analysis, but simple analysis. Sometimes it's just like, just don't overthink certain plays. And Veronica Hardy, she looked good in her previous bout versus Juliana Miller. And I hate doing MMA math, but Jamie Lynn Horth is a huge step up from Juliana Miller. And Horth is a good women's MMA fighter. She just isn't really that active enough. Um, and this would this is kind of the UFC giving her a girl that's been somewhat inactive herself. And it's a good spot for Jamie Lynn Horth to get on the wagon here. Um, you know, greasy narrative theory, Bill coming in here. Uh, you know who's going to be in the corner for uh, Veronica Hardy is going to be her husband, Dan Hardy, who him and Dana White do not have a good relationship. So uh, I think Dana wouldn't be happier for Dana White than uh, have his significant other take the L here in UFC Austin. Uh, no other reason why she would be flying out to England over to Texas unless to take this L. And you, I don't know, I guess you know that I'm probably going to look at the Canadian fight. You know, I'm going to look at the women's MMA fight, right? And, and this was a spot that I, because of the Homer status situation, I sort of ended up staying off of. But I saw exactly what you saw. Veronica Hardy, although she looked really stellar in the last fight, I really need to ask myself this time from now on, whenever I make a pick from now on, I got to look at the matchups. How are the matchups playing out? What are the matchups? And Juliana Miller is going to make anybody look good. Juliana Miller is just not not at that level and that's just i shouldn't be so disrespectful but she's just not at that level and that's what it is she's not at the ufc level she's in there and she gets picked apart and exposed by a hardy and now we're, we're going to come in against a horth who is you know she's a game opponent she she is very athletic and, and you're right she she does everything pretty sound and if this goes to the decision i don't even know if hardy takes around um so i for me i, I see it I the same way you see it 
Um, I actually, you know, my ticket that I have, I had a fourth thing on there and, and that was another one that was ready to go. But um, I definitely see your side on this one. Um, one I think this fight's lined at minus 155. But if we had to line it, I'm with you, bro. I would line this at like what? Minus 175, minus 200. I mean, I wouldn't go necessarily as minus 200 just in case, you know, we are then overshooting the Juliana Miller. as. as but that's what marker. I'm saying. But the minus 200 price tag would be like enough for me to finally bet the underdog is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I yeah, that this, is like a threshold. I think this price Anything over minus ballooned. 170. Yeah, I think this price could be ballooned up more than what it really is. It opened up at like minus 110 across like the books, minus 115, pick them, and it's going up to 155. I think the market's telling you what you need to know there. Okay, and we will look at. I have a play that is actually a little dirty two piece uh, because I've been rolling solo for the past uh, couple of weeks. I've been rocking with the, the two pieces. I think we missed last week, but uh, we've been hitting pretty regularly on those ones. Um, I'm going to come up with two spots and we may dissect it. You may actually change it on me, um, but I'm coming in with this and you tell me where you want to put some pieces. I wanted to find some value. We got a, a two piece parlay at minus 103. We have Soriano and Costa. Now the cost is the one where where I think you might may yeah. have to draw back on that one because I know that yeah, yeah I know I know that's one where you may have draw back with Garcia who is a dog, um, but man I, I just think that Cost is just going to have him basically outclassed on the feet like just really badly outclassed on the feet and you'd be able to use his aggressiveness against him. Um, I think the line maybe is a little bit wide, but it's not wide enough for me. Or sorry, it's a little bit wide, but I think it should be more down about minus two hundred. Um, but that minus that, that extra minus 30 is making people want to bite. The books know what the fuck they're doing. They're making people want to bite on the dog, take that dog money when he really should be probably a little bit lighter. I'm learning, see? I'm, I'm learning. Um, so for me, I, I'm with I'm with costs on that one. I get that if you talk me off that, you may talk me into taking that as a private play myself, as a not a private play, but as a money line play or find out my own prop. Um, but cost on Soriano, what do you think about those pieces in those fights? As much as I like drop it, one and add one. I feel like you kind of talked me into Bellato and Soriano as a two leg parlay at minus from forty six. I feel like I feel like that Bellato fight. The more the more that you kind of dig into it, the more and more it feels like Bellato could just smoke him early on in the fight. And that was kind of like your first intuition. So uh, I kind of like the Bellato as like I feel like it's minus four hundred for a reason. There's not a lot yeah, of. Yeah, I feel pretty confident about it. I've been for me because I've been trying to stay safe with all of them. I've been trying to sort of keep my my pieces separate. So I've been rocking the two piece separate away from the prop. So that way, if you miss on one, you're not getting destroyed on the other, or whatever it might be. But I do feel pretty confident about that. Um, so I don't hate putting blo I it's something I obviously thought about that putting Bellotto in there, but um, you know, just don't want to put too many eggs in one basket. But I'm not. I'm okay with that. I I do feel like it's it's a it's a spot. We just need Puda to show up. Because good Buddha Haley Soriato looks really fucking good. He looks like a top 15, top 20. Me, I shouldn't say top 15. Top, I would say uh, top 25, fringe top 20 contender in the division. Um, but when he does not look all the way on, it's like, who the fuck is this guy? Why did the USC sign this guy? So, I mean, maybe hopefully the ballooned up muscle should help him here. But I think it's more of a fade of Dustin Stolfus. Dustin Stolfus is in UFC viable. He got really lucky getting signed to the UFC by uh, Joey Body Bags breaking his elbow on a takedown de defense where they both fell to the ground. Joey Body Bags fell on his elbow, destroyed his elbow, lost a fight. Dustin Stolfus gets signed to the UFC. They haven't ran that one out yet, so maybe Dustin Stolfus might have one more UFC fight in him. But um, maybe Joey Body Bag is on to better, better and better, bigger and better things. Yeah, he's, he's uh, a level above now. I don't see Stolfus, Stolfus would have to come in and do something crazy as fuck to get even close to a sniff at that. Um, but Body Bags is driving Dana White's car, you know, hanging out. You know, doing doing whatever the fuck he wants to do. He's like Dana, one of one of Dana White's little sweehearts. Dana's um, just Dana trying to make like his return on investment. I mean, he paid for the dude's uh, living his whole entire 100%. first year signed under the promotion. So uh, it's only right for Dana White to give him easy fights so he can make fifty k bonuses to uh, make the money back. That's he's thinking smarter, not harder. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't. I know you don't want to. I know you don't want to read too much into social media. But um, if you look at Soriano on on social media and, and Eric Nixick on social media and even Extreme Couture, and I follow all three, um, it looks like man's pretty serious. And the and the camp's been like that room's been just generating winners, right? They've they've been putting in work. Everybody's just just pushing it. I mean, the lead of of Sean Strickland just pushing that pace in that room or love him or hate him. He pushes a pace in the room. And that's what everybody has always said. Um, so I just think with the the momentum right now with the Nganu, like momentum is a real thing. Like winners win. And, and that's why you see certain countries sometimes like certain gyms from certain countries. You'll see a certain amount of winners that'll come out for a little while, whether they're champions at the top of the division, Canada will eventually be there at some point. Like it's just, things win together or groups of people win together. And it's just one of those things. So I just think uh, it's, it's definitely a side here. And besides the fact that Stolz Fus, I think if to actually break it down, I, I think he's a decision guy. We know that. I mean, the, the slam on, on body's bags, as you were saying, it, it's, it's a, a fluky situation. Um, he's more of a decision guy who's going to sort of grind on you. Decent stand up, but Soriano, when he's on point and, and throwing a little bit more volume and, and putting some combinations together, Good luck, man. If he's knocking on the door, he's just going to touch that chin. And if it goes to the decision, I think he gets more uh, impactful moments and or gets rid of Stolfis later. Um, so I was Yeah, Greasy narrative the carry. Cable, but... I like how this fights in front of the uh, fans and stuff like that because it feels like this is a spot where Suriana gets up for one of the uh, main monster energy uh, fighter sponsors or whatever. So this seems like a uh, – him getting his ham raised and us going into commercial break with the monster uh, sponsor ad. <laughs> like, ad was the scene. That's like. a great point, actually, man. It's like, I know that's something that's talked about, but I mean, I really, now that we have enough time in the apex and there's been a certain amount of years, I'd really like to take a look at certain fighters that are sort of lackadaisical and how many of their fights for that were lackadaisical were in the, in the apex. And there's certain things that motivate them and certain things that don't. Like they bring it when there's a crowd, they get generated by that kind of thing. Like look what music does on a run, right? So imagine that what that does for a simplest person. Then look at the idea of a fighter walking into a room, you're getting ready, amped up to fight. And you got the whole crowd behind you versus walking in and you got your bosses, you know, they're right there. It's like, you're walking into a fucking board meeting, you know, Yeah, that is. You know, you know, like their friends and it, it just, I don't know. I'm definitely, that's, that's actually something that someone should actually look at, uh, it kind of it's kind of like a regional scene emulation to be honest with you like yeah. for them to fight in that small of a crowd they probably haven't fought in that small of a crowd since the regional scene that's why you always see people making their debuts or just random appearances inside the apex they just start going all out it's because they're probably used to that shit for the big name fighters they're probably looking around like what the fuck is going on why can i i can hear every fucking punch i'm throwing so you've talked me off Costa. Costa will be. Um, I think he wins. I'll just put out. No, I, no, I do too. But what I'm gonna do is I might find a way to it. It's not going to be a decision play. Um, but I will tell you, actually, I have a couple other spots that were on my card. Um, actually, one more spot left that was on my card. You know, it's obviously that didn't make the top for the actual podcast, but it'll be put out on social media is uh, Jalen Turner by decision. I love, love, Plus, love, love, love. Jalen Turner. Plus 225. Uh, I think that it'll play out on the feet. I think Bobby Green because he's finished and Jalen Turner because he he does – he's a very, like, a damaging striker that people might think it might end inside the distance. Uh, I think this goes to the decision. I think Turner's going to get the better of, of Green on the feet who's going to fall back into a Bobby Green of old that we would see striking on the feet, sort of boxing – trying to find his spots because I know he's trying to come in like a killer against certain guys. He's not going to be able to bully Jalen Turner. Um, and I don't see him trying to. I think he's going to come in with a little bit more respect. Um, Turner, though, has been cracked. We, we've seen that. Takedowns have been an issue, been taken down multiple times, but I don't see him taken down in this one. Um, I'm going to go with Turner, Turner decision plus 225. I'm looking at this little parlay here as we're speaking, and, man, it is just screaming out to me as value. You can get yeah, trying to. I'm trying to. Go ahead, go ahead. Four leg parlay here, plus three hundred odds. Could be two different parlays. Uh, so we could do the two piece we'll that by itself, and then let's hear the greasy. Let's hear. Let's hear the greasy part. The greasy ass four legger. Let's go. We'll add that Blotto, into a, like, as a play by itself. Blotto. Soriano. Soriano. Horth. Jalen Turner plus three hundred. 
Ooh, and then you what leave a potential hedge for Bobby Green if people that like to hedge hedge the parlays. I mean, really, if you're doing a greasy four leg, you shouldn't be throwing money in at the you're, you're okay with losing. You know what I mean? It's a greasy four leg. I know you don't want to lose. Those are four really solid spots, but you don't always need to hedge. If you always hedge, you're not going to make money that way. 50 bucks brings you back 200. Yeah, not bad. Well, uh, I'll throw that one in there as uh, like a separate play on social media. I'll make a little a little thing for it. So it'll be like a greasy four-legger. We'll call it something along those lines. So definitely with that, um, all spots I'm pretty confident in. Um, and I know there's a little narrative t- t- tied into what we're, we've been talking about and, and whatnot, but I just think that sometimes narratives do play uh, when the skill is already there to match and you're already looking at the breakdown with the stats. That makes sense as well, too. So moving forward, going into the new year, it'll be a little bit more of a restructure. But I still want to sort of keep the same idea. I like the idea of the three picks. And then we sort of just talk out some extras on the end instead of just trying to – sometimes you force and you end up talking about fights that you're not even interested in, fights you didn't even want to break down, and it's wasted air. No one wants to hear that. If you're not passionate about it, who gives a fuck? Like, why do you want to hear me talk about a fight I don't give a fuck about? And, and, I, and I mean at least on a level that I want to bring it as a spot to you, right? Like I, I care about it as a fan. I want to watch it. But I'm not going to – you know, so I, I think we keep that. But um, – bringing on some more cappers. Like I, I want to even talk to Mills and, and get him on as well too. Um, there's a couple other guys that are, are willing to do it. Kyle Nelson has told me that he actually wants to come on periodically because he does breakdowns all the time on his own channel. So uh, I'm going to get him on periodically as well too. And, and we'll, you know, keep rolling. And then as you, you will always be the the guest co-host or whatever way you want to do it and uh, jump on whenever the hell you want. Cause I know your seasons get absolutely crazy. So yeah, it's, it feels good to be back, man. Let's go cash some tickets. We only got a couple more events to end out the year, so uh, let those be profitable and uh, put some money in your pockets heading into uh, Christmas time and the new year, the time of the year that everybody needs a little bit of extra cash. So it's uh, up to us to do due diligence work, and uh, we got to be working just a little bit ten times harder, like the elves would say, because, uh, you know, Santa's coming to town, and uh, that's – in the adult world, an expensive paycheck. <laughs> you got a little bit of time to get that bankroll padded and fat and ready for UFC in Toronto. I, I see it on the horizon. It's almost it's almost here. It's going to be here real January, quick. January, right? And I have a whole bunch of spots. January 20th. That's a great way to come back to the new year. Yeah, 100%. Two days after my 40th birthday. Old fucking man. Yeah, I'm an old ass man. Old ass man. All right. Once again, like I said, for Billy Brizzle Post Sports Radio, I'm Callum McGregor. Tune into the Don't Tap Podcast. We out.